Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Bob. It's good to have you here with us this morning. Uh, some announcements. Uh, Chris said he wasn't sure if he was clear. You have to go on our rightnowmedia.org and sign up for workers' worship there. We don't handle the registration here. Uh, we would just handle all the other stuff. So if you missed that part of it and you're looking for it, uh, you can probably find it on our website. It's advertised there as well. And the slide will be up at the end of the service. You can write it down or go on Workers' Worship. It's the right now media workersworship.org, right? Something like that? Boy, we're on top of things this morning. Way to go. Hey, and I'll, I'll ask you one more thing. Um, I love that uh, we can start putting more seats out and all that, and I'm really looking forward to uh, sort of a return to what we've been looking forward to, which means we're going to need some more volunteers. We would love to start serving coffee at our hospitality ministry and making people feel uh, welcomed and get the nursery open back up, and as more people with children come, we, we just need some more help with greeters and with so if you're like, man, it's time for me to do something again or get involved or I would love to be on a list, uh, could you just shoot us an email or if you're signed up uh, on our directory, I think there's a way you can check that off. There's a QR code there. And we'd love to see if we can integrate you in serving each other and some of those things. I think that's all the announcements I'm supposed to do. Men, if you didn't catch it before, Valentine's Day tomorrow. Uh, they're shopping this afternoon, or gas stations are usually open till about midnight. Uh, if you get a Christmas tree for your wife, make sure it's not the green one. Yeah. Anyways. Car uh, the car freshener, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's all that's left. Uh, let me pray and we'll get to work. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the reminders and the things that you're showing to me. Uh, Together, as we turn our attention to you, just speak to us, Holy Spirit. Uh, reveal new truth to us, draw us in deeper, and Lord, continue to do your work in our hearts, in our lives, in our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We start a four-week series on prayer, and uh, if you go and look, there's, there's all of these amazing teaching and series, and right now media has more than you could look at, and and you, you just go online, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff because it's a really important topic. And uh, somebody said, it's just like the Christianity 101. And so some of you that have walked with Jesus for a long time go, yeah, I probably heard all this. And, and I would say, yes, and we need to continually be reminded because we lose focus sometimes. Uh, others of you will be very intrigued and uh, say, well, you know what? I've heard a lot about prayer, but I've never really looked into it, or my practice of it has, has been slipping. And, and here's this great opportunity for us to understand it and walk into it. Last week, we looked at the disciples' statement to Jesus where they said, hey, teach us to pray. That they knew it was this obvious connection with the Father. It seemed that as life grew busier and the demands grew more and more and more, he would continue to retreat to be with the Father and time with him. And they knew that somehow there was power in that, and somehow all of that was so strategic. And Jesus gives them what's not a simple repeated formula. He doesn't say if you just repeat these words and, and you just say this over and over and over, uh, you're good. He said that what he taught them were principles and practices to begin to implement in their walk with God. And we had this example of Jesus that we looked at. And in the early church, we saw that they were a people six different times in different words and ways. Talk about being devoted to, to persevere in, to continue in. The instruction over and over and over, and there's verses listed there, is that we would be, as the people of God, a people of prayer. And so this is a really key, important subject. And as life gets more busy all the time and it's not just information for you. I want you to really be able to engage in it. And then what we're going to do, 40 days out from Easter, is we've got journals for you. And, and, and we're going to get a reading plan together. And we've got a place for you to talk about 
journal what, what you're asking Jesus and what you're learning. And the, we're going to invite everyone that wants to sign up and go through it to join us. And for 40 days, as a group of people, be people practicing the presence of God and praying. People in the word of God in a determined way. And it would just, it would just you can decide how much time you're going to set aside and we're going to enjoy, invite you to join us in that process, and there'll be more coming in the days ahead. So the first thing I want you to see about prayer is it's an invitation from the Father. Isn't it nice to know who initiates, right? Uh, this isn't something where we were like, hey, uh, can we come up with a plan? The Father, it's, it says it's his will for us to be a people who would be in communication with him to pray. And last week I talked about this is a family privilege. If you missed it, you could check it out. Or I'll just briefly remind you that if you haven't become part of the family of God through Jesus' work on the cross, none of this will make sense. And it's not for you. When we talk about our Father who is in heaven, it's because we're adopted sons and daughters of God through what Christ did on a cross for us. We've understood that and we've responded to it and said we want that payment for sin applied to our account. And so it's, a, it's something that's initiated by the Father. It's a family privilege. And the parameters are set by God, not by us. Now, it's interesting that God instructs us in his word a lot about communicating with him. And he doesn't say, well, you guys just kind of decide if it's good feelings or how you want to do it or if it's repeating words. He, there's actually a ton of instruction in Scripture where he set the parameters. And we would like to say, well, maybe we should dress up. Maybe you should have a certain position. Maybe you should just be good with words. And if you look into the Scriptures, he debunks all of that. All of it. And he says, I want you to just come to me. And people say, well, wait a minute. If he's perfect... It, you know, it says his ear is attuned to the righteous. How does that work if I know what's in my heart and I know I'm kind of jacked up and I haven't got it all figured out? And, and I need to start with this reminder that it's an invitation that he's provided for. And so when he sees you, he sees you through what Jesus did on the cross. It looked after all of your sin. And he's just longing to spend time with you, his child. The ability to come, the righteousness that we have, isn't because we've done a whole bunch of good works, isn't because we cleaned ourselves up enough, isn't because our clothes are fancy enough to come into the throne room. The invitation into the throne room, all of that is reliant on what? The righteousness imputed from Jesus to us. He sees us through the cross. And so Hebrews 4.16 is great because it says, let us come boldly with confidence. Let us then with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. Why? That we might receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Doesn't that sound like dad's got some good things for us as we draw close to him? He's given us an invitation. He's given us the ability. And then in Matthew, you, you see these words of Jesus and they just impact all over again. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? I love the picture he's painting of a father wanting to bless, saying, come boldly in, wanting to find help in a time of need, initiating and inviting. In Matthew, he says this, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Anybody feel like that multiple times through the week or maybe even this morning? 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the verses we sometimes just rattle off or identify with, the, we know. And we need to stop and remember that God is giving us this unique invitation to come, to bug me. The desire of God, come to me, ask, be persistent, bother me. I long to meet with you, to hear from you. It's hard for us because we port some of our human relationships into this. And when we think father, and, and I said it last week, you know, all of you have had a father that said, ask me that again. That was a warning. <laughs> Don't ask that again. And Jesus says, keep asking, keep coming. You're not bothering me. I long to spend time with you. This is how you have access. This is where you come. You don't need to go through this alone. It's an invitation that the Father initiates and provides for. Secondly, I want you to see some of the importance of prayer. Now, full disclosure, there's way more than the ones I have here in Scripture. I just want to begin get you, get, getting you thinking and reminding you of how essential, how critical, how important this is. It, it's kind of like there's a few things you need for a motor to run, like fuel and air, right? And spark, if it's a gas motor. And if you check those three, that those are critical things, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. And in a sense, in our bodies to function, we need some critical things. And in your Christian life, if you're a child of God, prayer does some things that are absolutely of the essence for you. First thing I want to talk about is abiding, the essential to abiding. Um, My picture of the Pharisees who knew a lot about God but didn't have a heart relationship with him uh, is like when you talk about grafting, and Chris might get this really well, others might not, it's like they taped a branch onto the tree instead of being in the vine. That there's no lifeblood that flows through there. That, that, that there's just this outward visible thing, and Jesus said they're tomb, empty heart tomb kind of a thing. This idea that we're called to abide in Christ and we're called to be fruitful, this flow back and forth in the relationship with God needs communication. It needs just that, relationship. And the flow of this divine power comes as we abide in Christ. And that abiding can't happen without communication. I want you to see that if you need to abide in Christ, if you need the power of God in your, in your heart and your life to heal from hurts, to forgive, to have courage to take steps, to live a certain way. It can't just come from information. It has to come from this relationship that you have with the Almighty God abiding in Christ, grafted in to the vine. The, the imagery is there in John. Secondly, I want you to see that prayer is the key to realignment in our lives. When Jesus says, I'm going to teach you how to pray, he says, immediately you need to remember who you're talking to, our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. When you go to pray, you recall who God is. And you recall what he's done and how we have a relationship with him. It begins with this realignment in our lives of what he's done and what he's provided for us. And we begin to realign. It allows for honest reflection of our reality. We went through a series on lament. And if you start to go through the examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament, as people went and they cried out to God, and as the different Bible writers prayed, you see this reflection of reality. I don't like my situation. This is hard. I'm facing this. I need you to open this door. I need you to... And so it's not only who they're coming to and how they have relationship with them, but this honest reflection of where they're at. 
and their heart is poured out to God. Something interesting happens when we begin to do this realignment. We begin to remember that God has answered prayer and and who He is, and it renews our trust in an almighty God. And we begin to say this, your will be done. I have all these things I'm unhappy about or all these things I'm worried about or all these things I need to cast upon you as I cast my cares, as I take all of what I face and I release my cares and concerns to you. I can say knowing you're a good God, knowing you're a Father who invites, knowing that you have good things for me, your will be done. And there's this beginning of recovery, of peace, and of hope in your life. Now, you might say to me, Bob, you you don't know my situation, and I don't. And I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but I'll give you one of my favorite verses to take home this week and hold up as you practice. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4. Well, it's essential to the idea of abiding. You need to be a person of prayer. It's key to the realignment of our lives. We often hit potholes, get pulled to the side, take our eyes off the road, and need a correction. And then you need to know that God hears and responds. This is information that you need to put here in your life. Anybody ever tell you something you just generally could accept in your head but didn't believe in your heart? Ever been there? This is one of those things that we're going to get into obstacles in a minute. I think is really hard for us. So I I need you to see this is how God says it in his word. So this isn't Bob picking verses. God says, when my people humble themselves and cry out, I hear them and I respond to them. He's not saying come to me so that uh, I can just pat you. He hears and responds. Here's what it says in James chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now, this is a fantastic story, and you can go and read it. But Elijah prayed and trusted God, and God responded. God heard and responded. And you said, well, he was a righteous person. He was the prophet. And and I just went through why you're righteous and why Jesus said, you can boldly enter the throne of grace. In Psalm, David, chapter 40, verses 1 to 3, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise for our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in in the Lord. God hears and responds to his people. I could have read a whole bunch of verses there. And for some of you, this is a difficult thing because when it comes to prayer, you would rather go with what you felt or your human experience or, or maybe just your doubts that God hears and cares Remember I said God defines the parameters of how this works? So if we're going to actually believe what he says about it, not what we think about it, if we start with what he says, 
He cares very much. He hears your cry. And he responds. Next, I want to talk about wisdom and direction when it comes from prayer. In James 1, verses 5 and 6, it says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him, who ask, let, but let him ask him faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. If we look at God's word to us, and he says, if you lack wisdom, prayer is part of this deal. The ability to know the truth and how to apply it. And it's important that you come and you believe that what I show you in my word and what I tell you is the way to go. Because often it'll say, well, that doesn't seem to meet my immediate need or, or I, that's not what the world's telling me. To forgive, to live sacrificially, to, to do this, to say yes in this area, to... He said, if you lack wisdom, you can ask of me. I give abundantly and without finding fault. And ask him faith, knowing that my desire isn't to, when you ask for bread, give you a rock. It's to give you the best. And then Joshua, in chapter 9, I'll tell you the story here quickly. The Gibeonites are coming. Now, in Joshua, they've gone in and can't conquered the land. They've had the little mess at Ai where they took stuff they weren't supposed to take and they lost a bunch of people. And uh, God has been very clear with them. I mean, these people have walked across a river. They walked around a city. It fell down. Um, they have seen mighty works of God and they are concerned about doing what God asked them to do. And so they are taking over pieces of the land and and the Gibeonites know that this is going to happen and they get together and they're, in, they're directly in the path. They will be taken over. And they say, we got to get a plan together. So they got old bread and, and, and dusty clothes and worn out clothes and made it look like they'd come on a long journey and they came to the leaders and said, uh, we've traveled from a long ways off. We know that you're just taking whatever you want, that God's going before you. Please make an agreement with us. We're terrified that you're going to come our way. And uh, in the passage, it says really clearly that Joshua and the leaders said, well, God told us not to make a deal with anybody in our land, so, you know, we're not going to do that. So they did their very best. You know what they did? They looked at every piece of evidence. And it says they sampled their bread and, and they examined their clothes and they did everything they knew to do to stay obedient to what God asked them to do. But in chapter, or verse 14 of chapter 9, it has this little telling feature. They did not inquire of the Lord. And as they did what seemed best to them, it was a disaster because now they'd broken what God asked them to do and that became a problem for generations to come. The practice of prayer, the practice of going to God for wisdom, for direction. The practice of allowing him the privilege of simply giving you that additional piece of, of information, that truth and the ability to apply it that you didn't have before is critical in making these decisions. And it says in James, you just have to ask. I'd love to pour it into your life. Like I said, the importance of prayer, and we're going to talk about next week how it works together and corporately and with one another, and what we've seen God do as the people of God gather and pray and how it moves the hand of God. But today I wanted you to see it was an invitation provided for, enabled by God. He's initiated, come to me. I wanted you to see that it's important that the, the very lifeblood, the very foundation of your Christian life needs to be undergirded with this practice and this discipline. And now I want to talk about because it's so important and because it's this big invitation, what are the obstacles? What makes it hard? 
See, you don't have to think very long to go, great, Bob, you're making me feel guilty about my prayer life. I'm not trying to do that. In fact, that should be the last thing that happens. This is an invitation into fullness, richness. It's, it's a return to something. But let's talk about some of the obstacles to prayer. The Bible says that we have an enemy seeking to lie to us and discourage us and destroy us. The very first obstacle you need to understand is that this is spiritual. It's a key issue for him to interfere with. Now, this is way bigger than this little example, but see if you can follow me. I know lots of parents, I've worked with them, and your kids start hanging out with a bad influence, right? And you don't, you don't wanna really say to your kids, you can't hang out with a bad influence, but, but you don't really know what to do. And, and so what you do is you try and discourage the opportunities for them to spend a lot of time together or for your child to be under that influence. And you start to work behind the scenes saying, what I wanna do is discourage that because I don't want that influence in my child's life. Now, that's just like humanly this much, right? You have an enemy that wants to steal and destroy everything that's God's. And that you would have an intimate relationship with the Almighty God, that you would have joy and you would have peace, that you would be an effective ambassador for him in the world, that you would have this lifeline that flows clearly where you keep going to him and he's taking your burdens and cares and he, he's allowing you to forgive and he's healing your heart and he's giving you gifts and he's empowering you and that's all happening in this communication and relationship. He's gonna try and destroy that. He wants you isolated, alone. He's the father of all lies. So what's he gonna tell you? Come on. You've prayed, you've had a really ill friend or something that was just, you've even tried to make a deal with God. If you do this, I'll never. From your perspective, it didn't work. You didn't see the response you were looking for. Your loved one passed away or they didn't come back or your relationship's gone. Father of all lies. Don't see prayer the way God designed it. Don't see prayer the way God describes it. Let's view it from your experience. Then he'll come along and lie and say, you know, if you really had faith, that prayer would have worked. Because it's true that God does heal or true that God responds to his people or that you can ask and the lie that comes is, well, the reason you didn't get the result you were looking for was because of your faith. There's something wrong with you. And we know that that's a lie. We know that he's trying to keep you from that relationship with the Father. And yes, the Bible does say if you have faith, you'll move mountains. It's amazing things happen. But it doesn't say just because you have enough faith, whatever you demand of God will happen. Or here's the one that I think gets a lot of people. You're still living with guilt and shame. Somehow for salvation the cross covers, but this idea that my sanctification is ongoing and I know the crummy things that are going on in my life or what I'm still living with, I couldn't stroll boldly into the throne of grace, come confidently before the Father and ask because I haven't got it cleaned up. What a ridiculous thing when we know he knows everything. That while we were still enemies, he loved us and died for us. And yes, there are verses that say that if you're actively in sin and you're turning from him and you're unrepentant because it says what? A broken and contrite heart he will not despise. Yes, there's some truth to that, but Satan uses this to say you have to somehow clean yourself up. The cross is not enough. Those are all lies. Those are obstacles. 
What about some of our human obstacles? How many of you have a tendency towards doubt and deconstruction? I do. And so you have all these arguments like this. Well, if God is sovereign, he's just going to do what he desires and intends, so why would he need you to talk to him? Or how about this one? It's so human, right? I don't know what I'm supposed to feel, but I feel like when I pray, it's just bouncing off the ceiling. It's not what scripture says is happening. It's not the way God described it, but it's because it's how I feel, that's what I'm gonna believe. The one that says God already knows, he doesn't need me to ask. He can read my heart, and yet he's been very clear. Ask me, come to me, talk to me. The relationship matters. Or this one, does it land with anybody? My issues are too small. He's dealing with the Ukraine and convoys. <laughs> he can't deal with my lost keys or my just general depression today or the feeling that I'm so lonely if somebody doesn't smile at me or reach out. I don't know how I'm going to make it. Or your tendency to say, I prayed about this for a long time. It hasn't changed. I'm giving up. And then we have some more obstacles that we all sort of face. How about this one? I don't know how. Not doing it properly. It seems awkward. It's not natural or easy. I'm not good at it. I don't have the words. It's hard for me to take all this stuff I'm feeling and articulate it to God. Good news, the Bible says that the Spirit intercedes with our groanings. And, and secondly, if, if you want to just put a, a father-child thing in this, uh, as, I, as I watch parents with babies, I used to speak baby. I don't anymore. Because you just lose it somehow. As these kids are trying to talk and as they're making sounds, and their parents are understanding them. I'm like, that made no sense to me. And the parent will say, oh no, they, they, told, they told you this. And if prayer is growing in the relationship with God, if it's learning how to communicate, how to hear both ways, it's a muscle that's exercised. It's something you learn to grow and do it. And it can feel awkward and it can feel... But the Bible says you don't have to be good at it. All of you come to me. The invitation of the Father is for every one of his children. I've heard this one lots and it's happened to me. I'm distracted by everything. It's hard to focus. As soon as it gets quiet and I try and talk to God, I think about 47 things or I fall asleep. And I said, well, keep trying. Ask God to help you. Tell him about all the distractions. Spend time with him. This is a relationship that develops both ways and it says his spirit empowers us that he's at work in and through us. It's a discipline that we practice. It's a muscle that atrophies. And I just need to put this in and I'll close. Some of you have a conviction that you should have a certain feeling or get a determined result. Put that aside and determine to know Jesus and to walk with him. Determined to just spend time in his presence to abide. The feelings and results will come. So that's the big question. Friends, I would love for us to investigate this incredible invitation from God. It's essential to your walk with him. It's something that be, can become routine and it needs to have incredible life in it. Know that you can come boldly, that there's no hiding. God knows all. You, don't, you just need to confess if there's anything. He's faithful and just to forgive. The cross was big enough for all of us. To ask anything, God is waiting for you. And if you're like, oh, I want to believe this. I, I just, I want, investigate it. Begin to practice it. And friends, today, I, it's just so important for me to tell you this. Remember where your righteousness and accessibility comes from. 
It comes from Christ's work on the cross. You could never earn it or deserve it. There's nothing you can do that's beyond it. And so if those lies have set in, reject them. And determine today to begin to expand and develop this lifeline, this essential practice. As you go away this week, I'd love you to reflect on how critical this is. For some of you, it's simply a reminder, a renewal. You're like, Bob, yeah, you know what? It's been a while since I put that in the right place in my life. And for some today, this was a revolutionary breakthrough. You've never before looked at prayer and communication with God as anything more than an obligation or repeating something or just making sure that you said, thanks for your food, give me some safe sleep, uh, be with so-and-so. Remember that it's essential for you to be someone who abides. It's connected to where the life flows. That channel needs to be open. That it's critical to your alignment and your perspective that it's so easy to lose our perspective and our alignment in this world who's pulling us left and right and telling us lies. Remember, it's God's word that says he will hear us and respond to us. I'm not making you some vast promise based on nothing. It's on his word. His promise is to hear and to meet with you. And don't miss your need for wisdom and direction. You can get it all over the place. You can get it from your friends. You can seek it other places. And none of that's bad. But let's inquire of the Lord. Let's be people who listen and respond to where he's leading and what he's doing. And then lastly, be, I, I just can't even preach this without telling you, you're going to hit obstacles. And you're going to have to choose how you deal with them. First, you're in a spiritual warfare. And you need people praying for you. For, you need to be preparing, praying protection on yourself. And you need to be saying, expose if there's any area that I'm believing lies or the enemy has got me convinced and driving me off track and trying to affect my closeness and relationship with my father. This has come. And then counter the lies with the truth. Not words from a sermon but from the very word of God because he sets the parameters. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this. I thank you for what I'm learning uh, and what you're doing in my heart. I just pray for my friends. Uh, I just know how essential the practice of prayer is and I pray that you would renew that in us. And so thank you for your word. It's true. And as we turn and express our praise and our thanksgiving and declare truth about you through song. Would it be sweet to you and would it be, Lord, would you release us to worship in that way? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.